Good morning. <clears throat> Giving honor to our Heavenly Father, to our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ, and to the precious Holy Spirit. Amen. Minister Reed with you again this morning, and it's just a blessing to be alive, but it is a privilege always to serve God. I mean, we're just so unworthy, but it's, it's, it's just amazing and a blessing that God allows us to worship and serve Him. Amen. Our Bible study for the week of January 31st, 2021, our lesson is lesson number five, and the subject this morning is Women Speak Out. Now, what I'll do this morning, just give a brief overview, because most of the today is informational, it's not transformational. Paul is, uh, excuse me, Luke is giving us some accounts of women as they serve in Christ and telling us about their ministries, and so to speak. So we'll just, information purposes, we'll speak briefly on them because I just feel like preaching this morning, and I want to get to uh, uh, to preaching, amen, and share that with you this morning, amen. So our key verse this morning, our lesson, and it shall come to pass in the last days, said God, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Now, unfortunately for women called to preach, the discrimination against them is pronounced and overt. And in many black churches, female preachers are, not, are often not given the type of support and resources commensurate to their male counterpart. Now, they, like most women in the church, are usually more dedicated, loyal, and passionate about their calling, but are not shown proper deference from male leadership who seemingly takes their ministry responsibilities for granted. So despite this reality of oppression against them, women still shine, conditioned by a culture of inequality and in inequity that has persisted throughout history. And as the author of both his books, The Gospel and the Book of Acts, Luke never misses an opportunity to inform his readers of the significant role that women have in Christ. Luke has no shame in his feminism, and we are blessed because of it. So in today's lesson, there are three separate examples in Luke's writings are provided to show evidence of God using women, proving not only that the Spirit has come upon all flesh, like Joel said, but highlighting the role that women have had in the movement of believers. Our scripture today, coming from Luke's second chapter, 26 through 38 verse, uh, excuse me, 36 through 38th verse, Acts 1st chapter 12 through the 14th verse, 2nd uh, chapter of Acts 16 through the 21st verse, and the 21st chapter of Acts 8 through the 9th verse. Now in our lesson today, verse 36 opened with a prophetess named Anna, who Luke emphasizes had been married for only seven years from her virginity before her husband died. So being a widow for 84 years, she was more than 100 years old. And Luke includes this detail to establish her credibility as a well-experienced witness and to reflect the ancient respect that many had for those who chose not to remarry after death. As a devout woman, Anna loved and served God. Luke highlighted her deep commitment to her calling with hyperbole when he wrote that she did not depart from the temple, underscoring the long hours she spent in the temple. And as a widow, life was hard. And despite the fact that God had laws in place uh, to help the widows, uh, widows were often exploited and neglected, overlooked by the religious leaders who were charged to keep those laws. So there was refuge in the temple, and what Anna did, she made it her permanent home where she worshiped and served God, praying and fasting day and night. Now, at Jesus, when Jesus was eight days old, Joseph and Mary took him to the Jerusalem temple to be consecrated, and there they met Anna. And Anna came in now after Simeon had blessed Jesus and consecrated him, Anna came in and gave thanks to the Lord, and after the blessing, as if she was next on the program, Anna stepped up and spoke. And as a prophetess, she had a special gift of declaring and interpreting God's message and perhaps being known for her preaching. So Anna's words were received with the same weight of authority and credibility as Simeon's blessing. And through Simeon and Anna, Luke is reinforcing for his readers what Jesus' birth represents for the Jewish people. Also in, in, in the book, 
we see we have a passage of scripture, but just let me say this. Consider this first. There were these these some women that are they actually have planned ministry. They actually have ministries, and some of those mentioned work in some dangerous settings, so their names are not used in the ministry. But consider this: Woman A planned to go to a country so remote and so expensive to get there that no missionary organization would sponsor the idea. She went anyway. Woman B is a missionary in the Far East, uh, and uh, she's 91 years old, and she's still working. Woman C is a tiny but bold person who rescues children in danger of sex trafficking. Woman D, against the advice of others in a certain foreign country, visited Buddhist temples and spent time talking about Jesus with the monks there. Woman E deliberately hires non-Christians to work for her Christian ministry in order to influence and help them. Woman F has plans to minister to shrine and temple prostitutes in another country. You say temple prostitutes? Yes, there's still such a thing as temple prostitutes. And woman G was singing bars free of charge if management would just allow her to sing one Christian song during her set. Now, you may wonder at the apparent lack of preparation of some of these women that I just mentioned, but God isn't interested in perfection. He's interested or interested in willingness. Where are you in your preparation for ministry? Are you waiting until you're perfect? If so, you will never answer God's call when it comes. Few of us will ever preach to massive crowds, and few of us will ever build a mega church. But through his spirit, God recruits people for amazing assignment nonetheless. And this lesson touches on just a few examples. So if you happen to be a woman in the ministry, whatever your ministry is, speak, be bold, stand proud. If God has placed his spirit in his hand on you, then women, you just speak out. Amen. But these five lessons today that we have, not today, five lessons that we have left in our quarter of Sunday school studies are examples, or we'll look at examples of faithful women in the first century church. And all three of these women today that Luke talks about coming out of his book. And when you look at the analysis of his two books, which is Luke and Acts, it shows that Luke has a special regard for women. These texts and others afford us the opportunity to celebrate stories that are sometimes overlooked. These women, whether they're named or not, played an important role in the of, uh, of Scripture. Amen. Anna, the first one we'll talk about, is a Greek form of the name Hannah, the mother of the prophet Samuel. Uh, Hannah's prayer of thanksgiving for Samuel echoes throughout Mary's song of praise. Now, what I want you to understand is a prophetess is someone chosen by God, that's a prophet or prophetess, which is female, is chosen by God to speak for him as he brings something to mind. In the Old Testament, four women are designated as being prophetess, Miriam, Deborah, Huldah, and Isaiah the prophet's wife, who is not named. But the mention of these women, though their words are not recorded at length like the words of Moses or Jeremiah, these women served in the same way by communicating what God revealed to them for the people to hear. Luke also talks about, or shows us some passages where Peter used in Acts where he used what Joel said. Joel said in verse 16 that this is which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, said God, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see vision, and your old men shall dream dream, and on my servants and on my handmaiden I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. The prophet Joel, about whom we know virtually nothing, had foreseen the day of the Lord centuries earlier. That day would be a time when God would intervene dramatically in the history of Israel. Now, the last days refers to the beginning of the final era in God's plan for humanity. And we have been in those last days for some 2,000 years right now. But the inclusion of Gentiles was anticipated by the uh, phrase, all flesh. 
Then, so that he would not be misunderstood, Joel inclusively specified both genders and the spectrum of age groups. Joel's prophecy revealed that God's eligibility criteria are not necessarily what people expect. Peter spoke as if this prophecy was fulfilled, implying that some of the female followers of Jesus already had received this gift. Luke also talks about a man named Philip. Philip was an evangelist. It says in the verses, saying, the next day, we that are were Paul's company departed and came unto Caesarea, and we entered into the house of Philip the evangelist, which was one of the seven, and abode with him. Now Luke, the author of this narrative, was a traveling companion of Paul and was with him at the time of this incident. This is indicated by the use of the word we. In reading of the arrival of Paul's company into Caesarea, we take care to observe that this is the city of Caesarea Maritima and not the inland town of Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea Maritima was served as a Roman administrative center. But Philip the evangelist, who is not to be confused with the apostle Philip, lived in Caesarea Maritima. He is one of the seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom chosen for the ministry, the original deacons, if you remember that, in Acts 6, chapter 1 to the 6th verse. He laid across cultural boundaries to preach the gospel to Samaritans and then to an Ethiopian Enoch. Philip's home became a way station for Paul as he journeyed to Jerusalem for his final time. And the same man, we're talking about Philip, had four daughters that were virgins who did prophecy. The description of Philip's four daughters as virgins indicates their status as being unmarried, as much they lived in their father's house. Now these four daughters, which did prophecy, and their evangelist father were likely well known to Luke readers and were celebrated as servants among fellow Christians in that era. And although this is a reasonable conclusion by inference, nothing, nothing further is recorded of Philip and his daughters. Now what this tells us is that these women served God after the apostles and they, like you could basically say, filled in the gaps. In other words, they kept things carrying on. So God was using women as well as he was using men. There was an aged widow, a group of women who had followed Jesus and remained in Jerusalem after his ascension. There was a band of four unmarried sisters. We're talking about these four virgins who were daughters of Philip. They served. And we're talking about Anna back in those days they served God when they got the calling. They, so the question is, when God calls, will you answer? And I'll say to you, when God calls, you better answer. And just as God...